You've heard about compassion this morning. And, and, and certainly there is a connection between compassion and anger, which we are going to be speaking about today. Anger is the, really the, the lack of compassion along with other things. But you're going to have to get into a different mood. The, the mood that you had this morning was sort of coming alongside, was being moved and affected by other people. The, the mood now is you are going into war. And, and, and so you're going to be thinking and feeling something that's very, very different. So join with me in, in war, if you, if you would, this afternoon. In, in the title, it has something about anger, but it also identifies narcissism and borderline personality disorder, as well as anger that's in all of us. My, my focus will not be narcissism and borderline personality disorder, but, but since there seems to be a partition, a, a, a wall between how we think biblically and in all things psychological and psychiatric, since, since they seem to be two very different worlds, but we uniquely believe that the scripture has interpretive authority over everything, including modern psychiatry and psychology. And we, we saw that in Richard's presentation with depression, where here's depression, this modern psychiatric category, but he was showing how, how scripture breaks into that wall. Let me start off by briefly so breaking into that wall of modern psychiatry. Essentially, what we have is we have our lenses of scripture. We are focused this, after, this morning on, on anger and all things related to anger. So we, we look at modern psychiatry and there are a couple things that we see. The first thing we see is nothing. The first thing we see is nothing. Modern psychiatry and, 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 and psychotherapy, they're interested in anger, but it's curious that, that there, there are no diagnoses that are particular to anger. And, and I assume that one reason for that is since, since anger is, is distributed across all of humanity, there's nothing that unusual about explosive, angry people. So the first thing that is sort of curious as we, as we, as, as we allow ourselves to gaze toward modern psychiatry is, is the category doesn't seem to stand out as vividly in psychiatry and modern psychotherapy as it does in scripture. It stands out very vividly in scripture. If we look a little bit more carefully, we, we see at least a few things that emerge you see explosive anger in children, which we won't be speaking of today explicitly, but you also see very common words that, that are not necessarily diagnoses in themselves, at least the first one, but they, they're common. One would be narcissism. Narcissism is that, is that, is that self-centeredness where there is a, a brittleness in the face of even the mildest of criticisms. There, people talk about a narcissistic rage when, when somehow the identity of the narcissist has been in any way slighted. So, so and I should also say that within narcissism there is an utter confidence in the narcissist perspective of the world. So certainly, Scripture's discussion on anger reaches deeply into this very common term of narcissism. The other would be borderline personality disorder. The borderline personality disorder, for example, I work at a counseling center, I've worked there for a number of years, and, and I would say every year, somebody calls the counseling center and and says how much they hate me and, and, and how they want me to be fired from the counseling center. They want me to be dismissed. And, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna take, make light of that necessarily, but it really doesn't bother me that much 
Because these are people who, of course, at one time they said, you are the, you are the only person who understands me. You are, you, of all the counselors I've ever seen, you are the best, most, most understanding counselor ever. And of course, as we gain some experience in the human condition, we, we realize all the alarms start going off into our mind because the, the, the movement from here to here can be quite rapid. And, and there can be a certain loathing, a certain hatred that, that people who are, who are borderline can experience. There's also that confidence that their perspective is accurate and, and everybody else must share their perspective. The most important thing in the world is that they are understood and there's an insatiability. There's, there's this never ending demand to be understood. So in that sense, scripture, as it speaks to anger, it, it penetrates that, 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 that wall between, what we perceive to be a wall between scripture and, and modern psychiatry. It, it pierces that wall and speaks deeply to, to both of these situations. We are gonna be speaking about, about anger. I, I'd, I'd like to organize our time essentially just in two categories. And it's the categories that, that operate in, in, in really all our care for other people and all our ministry. The first category is that we want to know the person we're speaking with. The second is we want to know what it is that God says to the person we're speaking to. And the, the task that we have is, is, is really threefold in the midst of that, to know the person and to study them, to know them in a way that they truly feel understood. A second would be that we have this growing knowledge of scripture and what God says. But then the third would be, how do we join those two in a way that's skillful? So that's going to be our task this morning. Be prepared for war. That's, you are, you are walking among murderers. And, and compassion is not going to be the first thing that you are thinking when you are walking among murderers. Just a, my, my focus is especially going to be on what God says to angry people. But, but at least a short stop at, at something about angry people and knowing angry people. A couple from our church, they, they asked if they could meet with my wife and myself. And when they came to our house, and we had them over for dinner, it, it, when they came in the door, it was obvious that they had been in a fight on the way over. And, and the, the man was utter, he, he was, he was, he, he was red. He was, he, he was just, he was overcome with this anger toward his wife. And, 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 and she must have slayed him in, in some horrifying way for him to have that reaction. And so we simply asked, what's, what's happened? And as they were driving to my house, he, he was, he asked his wife, which way should we go? And he wanted to take a right. And she said, I think, it's, I think we take a left. That was the occasion for, for the fight. Have you ever heard anything more frightening than that? It, it, it's, if, if that, if this man has declared war on his wife, and the things he said were so, so calloused and demeaning. If he declared war in his wife because she thought going left was perhaps more appropriate than going right, and if he's willing to explode in front of an elder and a friend in his church, you know that what happens every single day is, is just plain war and destruction. So. I realize that Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. And I, I wasn't necessarily angry with him, but, but, I, I, but I was. Uh, because I was watching the destruction that was being meted out to this wife. 
And, and love has compassion, but, but love can also be aroused to anger. For example, when, when my, when my son-in-law, he, when he asked if he could marry my daughter, I said, I knew him well, and he, he was a good man, and, and I said, I'm gonna sound like a very typical father-in-law. I said, certainly, I, I've seen the way you love her, but if, if indeed you ever hurt her, I'll have to kill you, I'll have to kill you. And, and, and he, he didn't know whether to smile or to cry or what, but, and I, of course, I wasn't going to kill him, but, but I, perhaps I would like to if I saw him hurt a person that I loved. So, so I was aware of Proverbs chapter 15, verse one, in a gentle word, but I was also aware that his wife was, 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 was the recipient of this verbal violence. And I simply said, you are, I didn't simply say, but I said, along with many other things, you are the angriest man I have ever seen in my life. You are, you, are, you are frightening in the way that you have declared war. You are the most demeaning man who stands up in judgment and, and looks down. How dare you do such a thing? And, and he looked at me as if I had three heads. Like, what are, what are you talking about? There are, as we go through our conversation about anger, there are two things that, that, I, that, that stand out to me as having been especially important. And here's one, that the angry person is blind to their anger. Of all human experiences, this, is, this seems to be unique to anger. The angry person is the last person to know here he is because of a stop sign, because of, uh, because of a change of direction. He is speaking with cruelty to his wife, and he doesn't even see it. The nature of anger is that you are certain, you're confident that you are right. And, and the, more, the, the more angry you are, the more confident you are in your rightness. It's, it's the other person who is, who is clearly wrong. That's what the angry person is saying. That person is wrong and I am, I am right. The, the angry person is, is blind to their anger. First John chapter two, verse 11, identifies this very clearly. If you hate your brother, and anger is hatred of our brother. It says that you are in darkness and you're blind. You're blind. The tragedy, the double tragedy with anger is that the angry person is destroying people around him or her. The other tragedy is the angry person is so confident that they are right in their anger. They deserve to be angry. They deserve to, to meet out that judgment. Perhaps if you want a, a, an illustration or a metaphor for this, it would be a delusion. If, if you are speaking to somebody who has a delusion, one of the things we know is, is you, can't, you can't talk somebody out of their delusion. For example, I, I, had a, I have a friend who who believed that there were people who were spying in, his, in, the heating, in the heating vents of his house. And it was clearly a delusion. There was, no, there was nobody living in his vents. And, 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 and the more I asked questions, the more profound the delusion became. Yeah, I was watching the delusion grow. You can't break through a delusion with mere reason nor can you break through anger by simply holding up a mirror to a person and allowing them to see their anger because they're confident in it. That has been, that has been very helpful to me. It, it, what, does it, what does it mean? It means that means at least two things, that we will pray for an angry person 
Because here is a person who is, who is, if we go a little bit deeper, here's a person who is spiritually enslaved and blind, and your words in and of themselves are not going to turn the lights on. That's one thing we know. The second is that, that we're going to have this, this Proverbs sort of stance, where, where the book of Proverbs, it, it doesn't just map out the facts. It doesn't just simply, this is right and this is wrong. It is, it is committed to walking along with someone and persuading them. And, and, and it, it, we're, 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 we're expending so much attention. How can I offer this in a way that would be becoming, in a way that, that the other person might be able to hear? We commit ourselves to a certain persuasiveness with the other person. So two categories for our consideration. One is you, you want to know the other person, and then you want to know what God says. The person you're speaking to is, is in delusion. They are, they are blind to their anger. That doesn't, that doesn't render us hopeless, but it does suggest why it seems that anger and narcissism and borderline personality seem to be the most unmovable of human conditions. I, I was seeing a, a, a number of angry men during a particular era, and I was finding that none of them were changing. And I began to reflect, have I ever seen an angry man become a man who's humble and peaceful? And I couldn't think of any. And I, and I, went, to, I went to some of my colleagues and asked that question. Could you just tell me of one angry man you know who has changed? And they, they all sort of chuckled. Because, because we believe that God changes people, and he certainly does. He transformed us, and, he, and many of us who have been angry people, and he transforms angry men and women. And, and then when I asked them to, to be specific, they couldn't immediately identify any person. This doesn't render us hopeless, but, but the, the war that's overt this angry man or angry woman who is, who is wreaking havoc and destruction. There's this more profound war underneath where, where Satan himself, has, has, is it, Satan himself, the murderer, has found a kindred spirit and, and has gone into a partnership with such a person. And this is especially frightening. Who is the angry person? The angry person is, is blind and living in darkness. The second thing, who is the angry person? The angry person is oftentimes a fairly complicated person, as we all are, of course. I'll just give you one illustration of this. Sometimes anger is anger. It's simply, I want something and I'm not getting what I want. But other times, anger is, I want something and I'm not getting what I want, but it's, there are other layers of human experience. And, 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 and with men in particular, this seems to be relatively common. There, there's this layer of anger, but underneath the anger is a certain fragility, is, a, is, is, is fear. And, and so, so when we have the opportunity with angry people, we pause. What are you saying in your anger? There's, there's a language behind it, if you will. What, what is it that you're saying? Let me just give you one illustration, and, and I, I know that all of you could, could multiply these illustrations, but just as a reminder, here's one. A, after a church service, we, the, the elders of the church were, 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 were at the back of the, the, auditor, of the sanctuary, if you will, and, and we were there to pray with people afterwards. There was a woman who I, I'd known, and she, she came up, and she was going to ask for prayer. There was an elder who was standing right over there, and he saw this woman come up to me, and he came over to join us. And in the most gracious of ways, he, he asked, what are the things that are on your heart? What are the things that we can pray for? And, and this woman became increasingly agitated 
toward this elder. And, and over the course of a couple of minutes, the agitation grew to the point where she was yelling at him, and where everybody left in the church building could hear her. And then she started using profanity against him. And, and then she, in her anger, she stomped out of the church. You pursue her. And so I, I simply pursued her. And what happened? What happened? I, whatever was going on, it wasn't, it wasn't incited. It, it might have been incited by this man, but it, it, he was not the cause of it in any way. And she began to talk about a story. Almost immediately, she shared a story of how when she was converted, she was converted in the context where there was a street preacher. She heard the word of Christ proclaimed on a street, and and it, it all, it, it, the Spirit used this street preacher to open her eyes to the reality of Christ, and she came to Jesus. And then the street preacher said, now that you've come to Jesus, now I need to disciple you. And, and so for the next six months, this woman essentially was kept by this man and, and not allowed to be out of her sight sexually violated, essentially enslaved by this man for six months until he became, he became confident that she was not going to leave. And one particular day, he, he left her by herself for around 15 minutes. To make a long story short, she, she ended up escaping during one of those 15-minute slots. Now, now you can understand how she was a friend of mine but she saw this other man as spiritual authority. Spiritual authority had been, had been cruel and controlling to her. So anytime she's around somebody who wears that mantle of authority, even though I technically had that mantle, I was understood as a friend. Anytime somebody had that mantle of authority, she would, she would run. And if she felt trapped, she would be angry and and either have the other person run, and if the other person didn't run, she would run. Now, that's a story we, we, we all know without question. But I'm, I'm just, what am I saying? I'm saying that, that, that many times as counselors, when somebody, when, when somebody expresses a particular problem, and Scripture says so much about that particular problem, it's very tempting to stop there and, and, and bring scripture to bear on this angry woman's life. And by the way, the anger is something that, that she, she must attend to that anger. She needs to go back and ask forgiveness of this elder. But, but anger is also an opportunity to slow down and say, tell me more, tell me more. What else are you saying in your anger? I'll just say those two things under the heading of knowing another person. We could say much more, but, but this is an area where, where most of us have had experience, had experiences with our own anger and experiences with other people's anger. Let me move to the, 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 the second matter. What is it that God says to angry people? No. We know the first thing that God says to angry people. I am looking at this man who comes to my house and is berating his wife for, for somehow not agreeing with him with, with, with certain directions. I'm thinking about a woman who erupts with profanity against an elder. And what scripture does, of course, we see it in Romans chapter one and two, where in Romans one, it says, look at, look at, look at these miserable people. Look at these miserable idolaters. Look at these, look at these people who have, who have given themselves over to their idolatry. And, and then scripture in the beginning of Romans 2, and you, and you. Just when we're feeling as if we are, fi we are finally better and we're looking at the people who are a bit worse, the scripture says, and you. 
So, so when we first begin, the movement into scripture is we were first looking for some strategies to help this angry person. To, are, are there things that we can offer from scripture that would, it would help open the eyes of an angry person? But scripture in its own inimitable way, it says to first look at ourselves before we, we specialize in an angry person. And, and here's what we find. There's a certain kind of legalism when it comes to anger. And, and there's different forms of legalism. One form of legalism is, is we narrow our understanding of the law so it doesn't include us. Ah, you've heard that it was, was said, don't murder. How are you doing with that? I suspect most of us are doing fairly well. Uh, it, it, most of us have not murdered anyone recently. Some of you may actually have murdered, but, but most of us have not. And I'm sure if you murdered somebody, you believe that you had really good reason to do it. Uh, so it was all in self-defense. So, ah, the, the, the law is not relevant to me. That's the nature of anger. It's always the other person. It's never ourselves. And so what scripture does in the Sermon on the Mount is it expands the law back to its original proportion. And its original proportion is such that it expands it and it expands it and expands it until it finally captures you. So that's, that's the way the Lord begins his, his words to angry people. And so it becomes an occasion for us to, to stretch the law are you known for your hot anger? The anger that, 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 that can be explosive, but then all of a sudden it dies down, and off you go on your way. Meanwhile, everybody else is carrying these wounds from your anger. And you can't understand why they can't get over it in the same way that you got over it. There are, there are hot expressions of anger. And those are usually the easier ones to be incorporated into thou shalt not murder, which is, which is the, way, the, the initial way that Scripture speaks about anger. But, but for most of us, it, it's the colder variety of anger that we would consider. So what we're trying to do is we're first trying to say, and me, and me. I, I too struggle with these very things. One of the, the more poignant stories I heard from a woman was a woman who, whose husband was never angry. He, he never yelled, he never screamed. And she said, my, my vision of my husband is that he has turned away. That's, that's, that's the way I remember him, that he has turned the other direction in walking away. That's the way he demonstrates his anger. Anger, love moves toward a relationship. Anger moves away. Sometimes anger will move against the other person, but it also can move away. And, and it, it's that where I can find my own conviction in anger, where we just sort of move away in, in feeling hurt, in and expecting the other person to make the first move because, of course, they were more wrong than myself. And, and, and their confession, if there's any confession on my part, it should, it should follow their confession. Are you prone to sarcasm? Sarcasm, and, and Ken mentioned this even this morning, that sarcasm is a kind of male humor. And and, and I understand that on one sense. But, but, but as Christians, we think more deeply about such things. And, and simply because the culture allows a certain sarcasm in relationships, we also recognize that there's something potentially insidious and dangerous about it. Sarcasm is that I am better. You, it, it's, it's some kind of putting down of another person. Gossip would be the same phenomena. 
Gossip is a form of anger. It's, it's I am better and I'm speaking down against the other person. Or here's the, one of the, the pictures of humanity that goes throughout the scripture is, is this. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I'm innocent. It's that person. It's, we, we see it in the garden and it persists throughout scripture to, of course, this present day. Don't look at me, point. When we blame another person, and we can blame another person in all kinds of ways, what are we saying? We're essentially saying, I am innocent, and I bring damnation on that particular person. That's, that's, that's a harsh way to put it, but when we see the scripture speak about anger, it, it, it's, it's not harsh, it is, it is clear. It, it, is, it is opening our eyes to see the, the true realities behind it. Do you see that you can be an angry person? It, here's, here's another expression of my own anger. Grumbling and complaining. And when I see, when I, if I grumble and complain, it's not, it's not against any particular person. I'm not grumbling and complaining against my wife. I'm grumbling and complaining about the weather. I'm, I'm grumbling and complaining about my car. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just these hassles of life. Grumbling and complaining is, is, is one of the common sins that Scripture incorporates into anger. And as you look at the two places in Scripture, I think it's Exodus 16, the entrance into the wilderness and the movement out of the wilderness, Numbers chapter 11. Both passages, they, it begins with grumbling and complaining, and right on the cusp of the wilderness, there's grumbling and complaining. And it's, this wilderness is a bad place, and we want to go back to Egypt. It's not, not complaining against anybody in particular. They are pointing the finger a bit at Moses. And, and what the Lord says is, why do the people hold me in contempt? Why are they declaring war against another person, against Moses, and against me, the one who has delivered them? Gotcha. So the, the first thing we do is we consider anger, especially the anger of other people, as we, as we look at our own anger. And we recognize that, that we struggle with anger. Not just this, this man who came to my house, but we struggle with anger. Let's begin to now move through from some other scripture. Let's, we'll start on the surface and, and then we'll descend into, into some of the, the deeper riches of scripture. Here's, here's what we know about how humanity should live. I'm thinking of Ephesians chapter 4. And, 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 and there's a certain persuasion in this. To say to an angry person, you are an arrogant person and you have to walk humbly before the Lord. You are a harsh person and you must move to gentleness. That obviously will be ineffective in, in, in most relationships. But something like this. Ah, we are human beings. We actually are human beings who live before God, and, and as a result, we walk before each other in all humility. I'm just thinking of Ephesians 4, 1 here. In all humility and gentleness, with all patience. This is the way we live before one another. And, and, and can you see how, how this, is, this is something for all of us. In, in, in some ways, it's, it's a bit... It's a bit easier to digest for, for an angry person. And it lends itself to, could you pray for me as I pray for you this week that, that we would be able to turn away from arrogance and walk in humility, that we would turn away from harshness and walk in gentleness, that, that we, would, we would walk away from these ab abrupt judgments and and be patient with, with one another. Because we indeed, don't forget we're in Ephesians chapter 4, 
because in the first three chapters of Ephesians, we have seen God's extravagant and lavish grace that has been poured out to us as enemies. And as he has demonstrated that, that willingness to serve us, and his gentleness and his patience with us as, as warriors against him, we have the privilege of, of extending that to each other. This is the way we are called to live. And it's the way all of us live. Let's go a little bit farther in. All roads, of course, they lead to Jesus. Let's look at the person of Christ. And here, if, if I would give you two things this, this, late, this late morning, I would, I would, the, the first thing would be that the angry person is blind, which includes all of us. If, if you want... If you want to hear about your anger, ask those who are closest to you to speak about your anger. Ask your children to speak about your anger. Ask those who live with you. That's the first thing. The second is this. As we turn to Jesus, he was never angry because of what was done against him. Ever. No exceptions. As we we look at the life of Christ, we, we indeed see that he was angry. So we see anger in Jesus. Uh, he's, he's angry when children are kept from him. He's angry when the disciples want to rain down Sod- the, 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 the sulfur of Sodom and Gomorrah on the Samaritans. He's angry when, when the Gentiles are... Let me put it this way. He's angry because the temple has been turned into a marketplace. And it seems as though his anger is, is, is a defilement of the house of God, but it, it's, it's more than that. It's the marketplace, it seems to have been set up in the court of the Gentiles. And, and, and those Gentiles and foreigners who came, who wanted to worship the true God, now could no longer worship the true God unless it was in the midst of all, of, of all these yakking kind of animals. And it was, it was Jesus' anger that, that, that was brought to bear on behalf of the Gentiles who wanted to come to the true God and were kept from it. So Jesus could indeed be angry, but it was never because of what was done to him. Ever, ever. I would say with the, the angry people that I've had opportunities to spend time with, that has been a critical turning point. That, that if indeed the God of the universe, who is the one who has the right to be angry because day after day people have declared war on him when he is their master, if Jesus had zero anger in his life when he was personally violated, then, then who are we? that we would make this stand for our own rights and, 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 and turn into this vigilante party that, that accuses and condemns and judges and, and punishes. When we look at what, what seems to be behind Jesus' patience in the midst of maltreatment, it's 1 Peter chapter 2 where when he was reviled, when he was spit upon, when he was, when he was provoked, he didn't respond in kind, but, but he, gave, he gave them over to his Father who judges justly. In other words, Jesus, it, at those particular times, he, he was indeed the judge of the world, but, but he had given that to his Father and, and he entrusted, he entrusted the, the, the rebellion, if you will, to, to his father who judges justly. And so it kept one particular question in front of him. What does it mean to love now? What does it mean to love them now? What does it mean to love them now? There's one particular man who, who was so angry coming to my house and, and I proclaimed him as the most angry, ruthless 
condemning, vile person I had ever seen, for some reason we continued to have a relationship. And that's, I guess that's the benefit of blindness. He, he, didn't even, he didn't even hear, essentially, my rebuke. And, and we've continued to have a relationship. And, and, and he would say today that this is, he would say today that he has zero tolerance for anger in his life. Zero tolerance. He had, there's, there's, there's no room in any way for anger. By the way, I think, I think there is such a thing as righteous indignation, but it happens so rarely, it's not that important for us to master that category. He has zero tolerance for his anger because he sees, he sees his calling as the one who is united with Jesus Christ. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper now. And, and here's one way to do it. Our anger, our anger is an expression of, of spiritual realities. We, we live in three dimensions. We have things within ourselves. We have, we have life and problems lived in our relationship before others. But what we know uniquely is that we are always living before God. We can be blind to, 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 to that most fundamental of realities, but indeed, all of us live before the very face of God. And in anger lends itself to asking the question, how does this reveal my personal allegiances? Because, because even grumbling and complaining, as, as the Lord himself identifies, is holding God in contempt. It, it, it seems to be suggesting that though temporarily, hopefully, we have aligned ourselves with Satan and his devices perhaps it becomes an opportunity for us to consider what do our allegiances look like? And maybe we could ask this question. What, what is the anger of God like? And how do we know when we are with him or against him? So it becomes, so we immediately know that our, that our anger against other people is an expression of our rebellion against God. But now let's consider a little bit more of the character of God, especially through the lens of, of anger, and, 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 and see, see what kind of implications that has for, for our own life. Here's, here's what we see when we move to Scripture, that, that God indeed is an angry God. Hmm. Well, if God is angry, then we can be angry as well. So we have some sort of, some sort of wiggle room if you, for, for anger. But, but let's go on a little bit farther. Here, here are just some passages. I won't give you the passages, but you, you, you know some of this. He hates dishonest scales and the injustice associated with them. He hates evil. He hates arrogant, haughty eyes. He hates false witnesses. He hates those who stir up dissension. He hates divorce. And he hates divorce because it, it, it perpetrates an injustice against the person who has been left behind, especially in that particular culture where the divorced person seemed to be so, so unprotected. He is a warrior against those who perpetrate injustice. So indeed, Scripture identifies that, that our God is, 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 is angry. There is no question about that. If he is the God who loves he will be angry as those he loves are violated. If he is the God who, who, whose glory is of such supreme importance, he will be angry when his glory is, is violated. Now, now, at first glance, that can, seem, that can seem horrifying because, because all of us have been around angry people and have been affected by them in some way. People talk about how the ripple effects, the, how, how alcoholism just sends out these waves that affect so many people. Nobody talks about how anger sends out so many more waves and influences so many more people. So, so all of us have, have not only been angry, but we have, 
we have been the recipients of the anger of, of another person, and, and we have been changed as a result of that kind of violation. And, and, and so to speak about God as angry is a, is a frightening thought, and it should be, because we are using our human understanding of anger to consider who God is. And, 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 and here's, in short, here's, here's the kind of anger that God demonstrates. It, let's call it holy anger, rather than simply anger. Holy anger, we need another word for it. it, it, it we, we need to put it in a different category, and holy anger goes like this. It, it, I'm thinking about two passages in Exodus. Stand aside, the Lord says, and, 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 and it's time to destroy these people and start again. Moses, they can come out of your particular line. So God was going to be faithful to his promises, but these, 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 these persistently rebellious people, he said, step aside. Now when God says step aside, you step aside. But you see, there, there's some people who truly understand the Lord. And, 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 and Moses was one of them. And, and he understood that this particular anger was a holy anger. And it's a holy anger, it invites dialogue. It invites a conversation. Who would have thought? Have you ever encountered that kind of anger? Have you ever been angry in such a way? I suspect not. This is, that's why it's holy anger. He, it, Moses understands that God is inviting him to a conversation. And Moses goes on and says that, that you can't do this. You simply can't do this. These are your people. What, what are the other nations going to say? This, your glory will somehow be diminished. And the Lord says, okay, I won't. That's anger. It's as if it's put on simmer first. It's, it, it's, it, it, Lord's saying, Moses, I'm going to do something. I want to, uh, let's talk about this before I do it. But I'm, I'm going to put, I'm going to put the kettle on, on simmer so it just warms up a bit. Let's talk about these things. The same thing happens a little bit later where the Lord says, okay, off you go and my angel will go with you. Now most of us would think, well, I'm so thankful the angel will go with him, with us rather than God who can get angry with us. But once again, Moses is invited to this conversation. He says, no, that, that, that's impossible. You, you see, we are known as people of the presence. Our God is the God who is not far away, in, in, simply in the heavens, but he's the God who comes close, who is actually present with his people, who dwells with his people. And there is no way, we, I'm not going to go anywhere unless you go with us. And the Lord says, okay, I'll go with you. That's holy anger that that it invites us to the Lord. And there's a, there are these boundaries, if you will, around his anger. Now, I guess the question, how does this happen? See, we're, what we're doing is we're going into the farther reaches of, 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 of the character of God with the very purpose of, of knowing him and worshiping him and responding to him in a way that, that our, hopefully our anger as we come out of it is going to be changed. And here's, here's what we find in Scripture. In, in, in the Lord's... In the Old Testament, most, most, most glorious expression of the character of God, it goes like this. Exodus chapter 34. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, he just puts it on simmer a little bit. He invites you to a dialogue. Forgiving iniquity. Uh, and, his, and his love extends to thousands of generations. And then it goes on. But he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In other words, God, there's an imbalance in the character of God. His compassion and forgiveness is limitless. His judgment and anger is within boundaries. 
And, and then for those who are a bit confused by the third and fourth generation, the second, third generation, almost immediately in Scripture, you find it in Kings and you find it in no, no, a few other passages, commentary on this passage. And the commentary is that a son will not die for the sins of the father. And the father will not die for the sins of the son. The person is responsible for their own sins. The, the, the passage, the, the character of God is, is trying to demonstrate this, this glorious imbalance that his love has, is, 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 his love and patience are unlimited. His judgment somehow, for some reason, is always in boundaries. He, he's chosen to put it in boundaries. And then it raises another question, just why might this be? And the deeper reality here is, 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 is the imbalance indeed doesn't make sense. And, and, and you see, when there's rebellion, the cup of God's wrath is poured out. And in the Old Testament, the, the nations, Israel is told to drink the cup of God's wrath. The nations are told to drink the cup of God's wrath. But you never quite notice if they actually drink it or not. But when you get to the New Testament and when you get to the Last Supper, where the cup that Jesus drinks is, is the one that he drinks to the very dregs. And it is the cup of God's wrath that that is the reason why he's put boundaries on his anger, because it was going to be poured out on his son and not on us. That's the deeper reality behind, behind our anger. What does it do? It, it leaves us grateful. It leaves us humbled. It leaves us asking the question, who are we? That we would be, we would be the recipients of such mercy and compassion. But before we let go, though, there, it's also an occasion to, to, to recognize that clearly our anger is not in sync with the anger of God. But we're anticipating that if, if our anger is an expression of rebellion, it's going to look like someone else. And, and indeed, anger is, is uniquely offered as an expression of Satan's character. In John chapter 8, he, who is he? he was a, he's a murderer and a liar. Those are the, those are the two key features of, of Satan in Scripture. He was a murderer and a liar, and, and lying is his, is his native language. In, the, in Revelation, you have this picture of him just waiting for the Christ child to be born and for the progeny of the Christ child, and he is waiting to do his murderous ways. Thou shalt not murder is, is calling us away from imitation of the, the arch murderer. And, and, and then all of a sudden, these other passages on anger begin to make sense. Ephesians chapter 4. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give a foothold to the devil. What, what is it? It's, it, 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 it's, it's as if our anger... Our divisive anger in the body of Christ is, this, is an invitation to Satan. It's, 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 we are ready to have a partnership with you. And, 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 and Satan rushes in and, 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 and seeks to offer his own contribution to division in the body of Christ. You find the same thing at the Lord's Supper. You find that... that if we do not discern the body, there's, there's death that ensues because the character of Satan is entered in to the body of Christ. And, and, and I would suggest that not discerning the body in that communion passage in, 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 in Corinthians is, is saying that you, that you have allowed yourself to be indifferent toward others. You have allowed yourself to see yourself as over rather than as equal, or over rather than under. And there's something deeply satanic in that. You, you see the, the sobering reality of anger. Oh, sorry. Sorry if I hurt you a little bit. Off we go. No, no harm, no foul. It's, 
Our anger is an occasion for... People sometimes make the distinction between repentance from sin and mortification of sin. Repentance is we turn. We turn away from our sin and turn toward godliness. Or we turn away from our allegiances to Satan himself and we turn to Christ. Mortification is we do that more slowly. We, we are sobered by those allegiances and we allow the Spirit of God to bring conviction and, and true grief for, for sin. These are the deeper realities behind, behind our anger. When the Apostle Paul has a tendency to make these sin lists, he does it probably four or five different times. And, and in those sin lists, he, he specializes in two categories of sin. One category of sin we're very familiar with. It's the category of sexual sin. And, and, and certainly all of us are familiar with the, with the ravages and the destruction of sexual sin in forms of pornography, in forms of, of adultery, and all kinds of sexual perversions. What sometimes we don't recognize is the scripture gives the same prominence to anger. If you, when you look at those, the, the sin lists in scripture, the Pauline, Pauline sin lists, division and factions and, and jealousies, it's the, it's the anger sort of continuum. And he's trying to say, this is so blatantly demonic. Keep your eye on it. If we're speaking about pornography and sexual sin in our church, we should at least, according to the Apostle Paul, give equal attention to the anger that exists in, in all of our hearts. What do we do? We set off to the opposite. To being in Christ to walk in humbly before our God, to aiming for the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. We, we aim to, to be more wrong than the other person. That's what Matthew chapter seven says, Matthew ch chapter seven, three to five, that, that look, for the, look for the log in your own eye rather than the speck in the other person's eye. What can you do with an angry person? Let's do this. Let's spend the next half hour simply confessing sin. Simply confessing sin. And let's do it together. That is, that is, doing, that is doing direct battle with anger. It is, it is lowering an angry person. And 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 and, 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 it, and it's hard. It's hard to be. It's hard to be angry with someone who is righter than we are, it, where we are. Where we are. Our sins are are, are 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 more pronounced even than theirs. To to aim to be a tax collector. This is Luke chapter eighteen. There's a Pharisee and a tax collector. They go to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee. God, I'm really thankful that I'm not like all these other people, especially this tax collector. The tax collector, as you know, he beats his breast, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the scripture, and then Jesus says, and he, the tax collector, he's your hero. He is the one you hope to imitate. He, that is, he is the one who, who has been the recipient of faith and, and justification and renewed righteousness. To, to simply practice confessing sin. Where are we going? We're, we're, we're seeing the, the horror of anger a bit more clearly. We're seeing the spiritual depths of it. And as we come out and say, where do we go? What we anticipate from Scripture is that it's not going to be anything different than what we, what we see throughout all of Scripture to humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift us up. 
to simply confess sins. As the, as, the, as the Lord's Prayer leads us in confessing sin. But here's something. One of, the, one of the, 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 the hardest passages in Scripture, I think, is, is that passage about the, uh, the servant who, who condemns his servant. And let me read it to you very quickly. You, you know how this goes. Let me give you just the middle of the story. Again, you know this. A servant, a servant was owed money. I mean, somebody was owed money by his servant. 100 denarii, 100 denarii or so. He grabbed the servant, choked him. Pay back what you owe me. And if you refuse, I'm going to throw you in prison. It's, it seems a little harsh, but people are supposed to pay back what they owe us. It's just... It's, Sort of the way the economy should run. And that's the way an angry person thinks. They're blind to the realities of God. They function as God. You owe me and you haven't paid back. But here's how the story goes. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who, who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. And, and as he began to settle these accounts, there was this one person he, he owed far more than he could ever repay. And the king forgave him of all of all this. And then you read a story of, of that same person going out and demanding a hundred denarii for another from another. And it seems like it seems like one of the hardest passages in scripture. It's one of the kind of passages in scripture which will make you angry. It, it, it makes no sense in light of God's love now revealed. What am I doing? I am. I'm walking with an angry person. We're practicing confession. We are practicing seeing spiritual realities. We're telling the entire story. Indeed, the an angry person may have been hurt and, 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 and wronged by others. But there is this much larger story that we must tell, that we have wronged another, and he has forgiven us for, for all those things. Here's another passage, and, and this is one that you know, and it's... If you look for, if you want one passage that in, in the most compact way captures everything about anger, it's James chapter 4. And I won't go through the entire passage now, I'm sure you know it, but I do want to remind you of the, the, the Jewish style within James chapter 4. When I say Jewish style, one of the features of, of, of Jewish writing is, is, is in most writing, you, you want to get to the important part. You want, to, you want to bring it to a bit of a crescendo at the end and, and, and leave people with, 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 with something that's, with, that's meaningful. In Jewish writing, you want something symmetrical. And if you want to find the most important feature of a, of a Jewish letter, look right in the middle of it. James talks about anger. And he says this, where do fights and quarrels come from? They come from your desires that battle within. You want something for your own desires and, and then it goes on and says that, that you are adulterers. You are betrayers of God. You are haters of God. So it, it allows us to see these more profound spiritual realities much more clearly. But here's what you find right in the middle. It's a short passage, but it is, it's glorious. And it just it comes at you very quickly. Yeah. And you have a God who is jealous for you. You're jealous for, for what you do not deserve. You have a God who is jealous for you. Now, have you ever had anybody jealous over you? Where they wanted you, they wanted you for themselves? Uh, there, there's something that might be a bit perverted, but there is a kind of expression of love. Here is the reality that God is saying to angry people. I want you for myself. And in your anger, you are, you, are, you are moving away from me. And in my jealousy, it's, it's almost embarrassing, isn't it? Where the Lord, to, for him to speak of, of, this, of the depths of his jealous love for somebody who is in the act of adultery. My, my jealous love is aroused for you. This is, what is this? This is, this is the cross of Christ embedded right in the very middle of this passage on anger. That it, it's why we were enemies, Christ died for us. 
that's, that's at the very center of, 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 of one of the richest passages in Scripture on anger. The very center is, is Christ being jealous for his enemies and having done something about it in the person of Jesus Christ. So, what do we do? There, I, think, I think we've even heard here the call to gratitude and how gratitude is, is stylish these days, how gratitude is popular these days. And if, there, if there's anything popular, usually, usually it's just a little superficial layer of, of much more profound realities that we have access to. What can we do? Given, given this very center of James chapter 4, all we can do is say thank you. Thank you. Confessing sin, knowing the gospel of Christ and he dies for enemies, and saying thank you. That's, that's, that's our everyday life as, as God's children, isn't it? And it just so happens this seemingly immovable, intractable problem of anger in its, in its manifold forms, that's the way it yields. And the same in these very ordinary responses to, to who the Lord is and what he has done for us. We'd want to add one more thing, would simply be this. Lord, forgive me. Thank you. And, and then to, to take a little bit farther, go farther into James 4, instead of saying, today I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, we say, if it's the Lord's will, I will do this. If it's the Lord's will, I will do that. That's, those are God's very simple words to angry people. But... But before we get to those simple words, we go into the very depths of the universe, of spiritual struggles, of of rebellion against the Holy God, and the Holy God who takes the initiative toward his rebellious people. And as an expression of his jealousy, he brings us to himself and for some reason wipes out our sin, calls us to turn to him. It's good news, isn't it? Very good news. We have a couple minutes, and, and if we had more time, perhaps the question I would ask would be, and, and, and when have you been able to dis- disarm an angry person? When, has, when have you been given grace to disarm an angry person? That would be a question where we, it would be fascinating to, to learn from each other. Or, when have you been disarmed in your own anger? When is somebody just in, 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 with an apt word, with gentleness, when has somebody been able to disarm you in the midst of your own anger? So it's a great question. Probably now is not the time for it. Now would be the time for responses and, and, and brief questions.